get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals like doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, stop just trading time for dollars and shift from one-to-one client work to -to one-to-many work. It's an exclusive group coaching program for professional service entrepreneurs who want to scale up. Go to rise25.com. There is a downloadable free dream product ladder that helps you map out your business on one sheet of paper and realize untapped revenue potential. Companies like Starbucks and Disney have an amazing product ladder, and you can also. I am very excited. Today we have Randy Brill. She's founder of Cora Core and Teacher Peach. Cora Core is a full-service creative agency that helps companies dream up the right products, solutions, and strategies, and we will talk about how they do that in their special lab. In 2012, she started her own e-commerce company, TeacherPeach.com. The part-time experiment is now a top seller of teacher gift totes and classroom products on Amazon. And I think they sell tons of stress balls, too. She's well, the, is everybody stressed? Exactly. <laughs> She's the author of, check it out, 99 Creative Wows, Words of Wisdom for Business. Randy, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here with you. I'm excited, and I want to talk about the book, but before I talk about the book, you know, through my research, I found this out, and I needed to know the answer to this. Uh You wrote your first sales order in crayon at age three from what I've read. So I I need to know what, what this was about. Well, my dad traveled on the road, and in those days, you didn't have an iPad, you didn't write your orders right as you were there. You went, you sold, and you came home, and you had to write your paperwork. My dad could sell anything to anyone, hated doing the paperwork. My mom was trying to help, and so she'd have the desk all organized, and everything was pre-printed envelopes, and it was a big issue. He would get home Friday night, they'd be stressed about it, so I decided to help. So I did my coloring, I got up, I put it in the self-addressed envelope, I put it in the mail thing, and every Monday morning, my mother and I would walk to the post office, we didn't have a car, we'd walk to the post office, drop it in the mail, and two weeks later, the boss called the house, and I was allowed to answer the phone. And I answered the phone, and he said, is your mom there? And she, my mother's standing there turning like, Ashen, and she gets on the phone and she talks to him and he said I really just called to thank Randy for her order you know Mrs. Davis and I don't have any children and I have Randy's orders hanging all over my mm. desk now and that was my first order that's pretty cool so, so I watched the process followed it and sent him an order you were born to sell I guess so what did, uh, what did yes. you sell uh, at that time it was watches my dad sold anything. I mean, he was a true demonstration that if you could sell peas, you could sell carrots, and you could sell airtime, whatever it is, if you knew how to sell. And I guess I got the selling gene. But the difference, I think, for entrepreneurial sales is the passion, the commitment, and the certainty that you as an entrepreneur definitely believe. I really can't, I can't sell anything I don't believe in, right. but if I believe in it, I'll be more than happy to see if it works for you. What's a big lesson you learned from your dad? (sighs) To do business my way. Um, My dad was a retailer and um, a very old school retailer. And my way was, you know, at one point he bought a business. He was, he was 50, bought a business and a bunch of stuff happened and he said, I am the president, your brother is the vice president, your mother is the secretary, I'll be the treasurer, and I'm sitting there eating spinach. And I looked at him, he said, you can do the logo. And I remember being so, what? And I, in a split second, was like, oh well, I'll start my own business. And that was a defunct, but that was, look at how powerful that was. It was something that could have been very hurtful, but he didn't mean it. 
It's just in his world, you're an artist, color. And in his world, I'll handle the money. I'll be the president. I put my son on there to go in the business and my wife on there because I need her to sign. All very logical. But in my world, it became a pivotal turning point to say, I'll start my own, yeah. my way. And you, I did. And now my brother has a business, too. So we both do it very differently. I mean, you did study graphic design at Carnegie Mellon. I so sure did. that part, that sort of carried through a little bit with the design and, and creativity. Well, listen, my parents bought a house four blocks from Carnegie Mellon when I was nine so I could walk to college. Really? And I did. I literally did because it was the right education. You know, um, I've heard amazing things about it that it, um, for entrepreneurs specifically, makes you think. It makes you. What did you Carnegie get out Mellon of it? Yeah. trains you for your second job, not your first. Hmm. They train you to lead. They train you to direct. They train you to take risks. All that's wonderful, but they don't tell you how to eat in the meantime when you can't get the first job. But, but I did. I did. I got my first job. I came to Chicago and I bought three airline tickets and I interviewed and interviewed until I landed a job. And my job was design and educational publishing, which back then was a very different kind of business than the science of learning that it is today. But that's how I landed in that kind of, of creative design problem solving. Mm. So let's talk about the book, 99 Creative Wows. And I know you broke it up into personal, creative, and business. Is yes, that right? different so, categories. Yeah. So talk about what are some of the wows in there? Well, just happen to have a copy. Well, yeah, let's hold it up for a second. For some reason, someone told me somewhere, I don't know if it's true, that when you hold up the book and you show it to people, it gets more sales than if you just mention oh, it. Well, then, there we go. Yeah, um, so... This book is a labor of love. This book is a culmination of having worked with a lot of different staff, people learned from some very powerful, amazing people who taught me life lessons. And you talk about Carnegie Mellon, some incredible professors that imprinted certain messages on me that I was then able to take and translate, not realizing I even knew them till a life situation or a business situation would come up. The, the three factors, you gotta know personally who you are and what you do and what makes you tick to excel in anything you do to inspire anybody else to do great work to do great business to be fair to be creative however sometimes is this kind of once removed experience i'm a very creative person you can say to me oh my gosh how did you think of that sometimes i look at you and say i don't Right. It's hard to define sometimes. You have to be open to it. It comes through in a variety of ways. So what this was, was a collection that allowed me, typography has always been a passion, you know, being able to take letter forms. Here's one, for example, which hmm. is fix whatever is keeping your customers up at night to add value to their days. And just the typography. That one happens to be a business one. Another one that's a personal one, which is, always take the high road it's never the wrong route can you tell me a situation where a person should not take the high road <laughs> i i cannot come up with one um there are uh ones about um just start you'll figure out the next step after the first you know sometimes people are very busy trying to create a whole master plan sometimes you just have to begin and trust your gut one of the ones that i totally love is pair your where's your guts it's pair your guts with creative guts and that's it's here somewhere yeah I'm hold sorry. it up too um you know now i see why you didn't jump to do an audible version as we were talking see, off because it doesn't really get do it justice like the book i didn't realize how the pages were laid out and how creative is well, usually and I try and, never back into your future i mean yeah. the range of what these are is and this is a, a you know two really powerful ones one for personal and one for creative always look closely because very often what drives people to make a decision make a choice or not make a decision is that fear is very often the real driver it's not necessarily people want to achieve something they're afraid of something 
bigger and more frightening. Hmm. So that's often a, 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 that's a life lesson. I go through these with my kids too. Uh, and from a creative perspective, somebody may steal your current idea. And this happens a lot. And I, can, I know it's wonderful to say it's the greatest form of flattery. Not always on a Thursday when you've worked and you know it is your intellectual property. But remember, somebody can steal your idea. What they cannot steal is your ability to create the next one. Right. And so you end up recognizing... I think Disney has a good quote on that. Something like, they can steal your idea, or but not your magic, or whatever. It's they something do, yes. of that they, form. They, yeah. they do, they so do that's, a lot. That's a good one, yeah. And then these last two might just be fun. One is gratitude builds confidence. When you think about that, when you're grateful, you can't have a bad attitude. When you have gratitude for what is around you and what you've accomplished or what the people around you are going to help support you to do or that you can help them do, you build confidence. And confidence drives entrepreneurial leadership. Yeah. And then lastly, from a creative perspective, do not fall in love with your work. Leave that to everybody else. And so this is what these are about. They fit together in a variety of ways. My very powerful one which is number one, which is family first, always. Hmm. And, and so this book is something that I hope recent graduates starting out, you know, starting entrepreneurs. I have high school students using it. There are teachers in Chicago public schools going through this book, choosing motivational mantras for their classroom year this year. What things are they going to use to help instill energy and inspiration in their kids so we're yeah. really excited about the yeah. book thanks for sharing that Our i could see some of those made into like posters or something too well, we're talking about posters we're talking about playing cards you know the grand merchandiser that's all coming back exactly. <laughs> so be watchful of course on amazon that's yes. where we live okay so yeah that's the book we love it uh, thank you for sharing some of those Sure. I want you to talk about the don't fall in love with your work one for a second um, okay. or product. Don't fall in love with your product. I'm sure they often come out of personal experience. Was there a time where maybe there wasn't the best idea that you held on to for too long that you could have been doing something else? Um, in communication and publication design, which is where I had my roots, one of the parameters was I never showed one solution. Okay. Because you only know, you bring your creative wisdom and energy to the problem. What you don't do is live the challenge in the same way your client does. So my role was always, you need three choices and none can be a false option. But the challenge is when you're working creatively, if you go down this path or you go down this path, you go down this path. If you fall in love with one of those three options, the other two are false. And the challenge with a false option is then you don't believe in it. So yeah. for me, my client's guy, when I see that little turn of a corner of a mouth when they're looking or the twinkle and I think, oh, they're going to go over here. But the three that I present, right. never 33, but the three, I have to be able to, to confidently know I can help them get to their finish line with any of those three options. Right. But if you fall in love, then you're invested in your work. Your investment has to be in the project and the client's primary goals and objectives. Yeah. You can love that. You can halt the creativity also if they kind of go down one path. You can, you can be you can end up with blinders to other ideas. If you get too sure too soon, yeah. You close, close yourself off from other creative possibilities, which is why people say, oh, you're a creative designer. Oh, you can color. And I will tell you, I can. I can take a marker and listen to what you say. I've been in meetings where people will be talking, talking, and I'll grab a piece of paper and I'll say, okay, and I'll color and I'll say, is this what you mean? And invariably, two will say, absolutely not at all. And then we can talk. Then we can start to put it together. So, yes, I do that. But one of the most powerful things that I end up doing is how much I listen. You listen. I ask why five, six, seven, eight times. You know, well, why is that? Well, because we found out that. Why do you think that is? And it's like peeling mm. the onion. Yeah. You got to know the right problem to solve. Yeah. 
I want to pause there for a second, Randy, because sure. that is so powerful and understated. I think anyone listening to this um, should, you know, is listening but saying why and peeling out those layers to really uncover what the true reasons are. You got to get to the root cause. Yeah. Invariably, and one of the rules, one of the reasons we do this creativity lab problem solving that I know you want to get to in a minute is because so many businesses and so many you know, executives and entrepreneurs and leaders who are entrusted with big responsibilities spend a lot of time, money, energy, bandwidth, resources, everything solving the wrong problem. Yeah. Now, when you solve the wrong problem badly, what happens? It blows up. And everybody knows no one is clueless. So it's very messy. Everyone has disaster all over them and you brush your knees up and you say, well, that didn't go very well. It's very overt. It's very obvious. But when you solve the wrong problem beautifully, everyone, you talk about falling in love. Everyone's, well, we've already invested $3 million in this and it looks so good. It is it's a dangerous well, it's thing. Yeah. Full. But if, it, if you solve the wrong problem well, you are actually further behind than if you had an implosion, yeah. which is why we go through a lab to get to that root cause. That's, yeah. You know, uh, someone told me once, uh, be careful putting your ladder up against the wrong building type of thing. And that's, that's exactly, exactly right. It's but, exactly the same metaphor. Yeah. But, no, I like what you said because if you do it really well, then – it's further it's down the line. You don't discover it right away. And then well, you're further behind. Well, you're further behind and yeah. everyone's more deeply invested. Yeah. So it's harder for people to let go. Believe me, when it implodes, everyone is very happy to distance themselves. Oh, yes. Well, you know, what is it I they say? Blame it on the predecessor? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What about, what, you know, what, what's challenging? There's a number of, there's so many moving parts in what you do with core core. Oh, yeah, and one of them I think is out of can be out of your control, but is not. Which I'm curious how you deal with it is when people come in, they have their own, like you said, their beliefs, what they think is going to work. How do you get people to stay open in that situation? Because even if you present before you even present the options, people are they think they know they can be maybe be closed off, or you know, everyone in the room is probably very smart. So how do you keep them open to the new ideas of their creativity in general? Because I don't start with that. If I had a box of ideas, like shoes, and I said, okay, well, here, try blue. Wait, these are your size. Go ahead. That's trying to take a pile of solutions and retrofit them to what I might from over here think the problem is. The key is you come in and you talk to Coracore with ideas that's your foundation. That's your baseline. Of course you have ideas. And you have ideas. There are, there are reasons you like them. There are reasons you're invested in them. There are reasons they haven't worked. There are reasons you're staying away from them. I mean, people come to us when they don't know what to make. They come to us when they know what to make, but they don't have the time. They don't have the money. They don't have the bandwidth to pull it off. So they need to either make something else that's equally good or they need help making it, or they come and they say, um, Randy, we made this, it's broken, and we need to do something else. And that's the baseline. You've got to start where your client is, you've got to start with their legacy and history, because they live this every day. I sometimes say I'm like the Lone Ranger, well, my job is done here. It's never done till they're ready to solo and pilot with it. You know, and, you know, very often we'll finish a project and six months later they'll call and say, you know, when we were working on that other one, you said something about such and such. Are you ready? I think now we finally are ready to look under that stone. You can't push people to be ready for more than they're ready for it from a business perspective, from a creative perspective. And, of course, we all know from a personal perspective. Because if that were true, people would always be in perfect relationships, right? I mean, we make the choices we make based on the data we think we have, what we're scared of, what we think we want to accomplish, and what we think we're supposed to want to accomplish. So the lab gets under that to make sure that we can at least get you to a starting point. 
I want you to talk a little bit. I know uh, probably a lot of the companies you work with, um, there's non-disclosures and things you can't talk about. Absolutely. But um, talk about one example, and there's one company about a product, uh, a name that you were <laughs> talking about. Well, that story. You know, all right. Let me tell you something about a name. She, who names it, owns it. You have a product, you have a concept, you have an idea. One of the first things here, we do this little practice thing in our lab. We, you know, a lab takes two days, but I can't tell you what a lab experience is about. So I created this little 23 minute glimpse into a lab and it's 23 minutes because if I told you it was 20, eh, if I told you it was 30, but 23, I have people who go in and I have these little clocks here and I say, you see, that's a six minute exercise. You see, that's a this. And it takes you from, okay, I need to create an idea. And it's basically the first thing you do is you dream it. What are you envisioning? Then you capture it and you let them spill their thinking, you know, do the brain dump, pull connections together. Then you synthesize it and choose it. Then we play a game with it and we ask all these questions and we say, cut these apart, move them around, ask yourself these questions, turn it on its ear. What would this look like if it was a tenth the size you're envisioning? What would it look like if you didn't have to do this at all? Do you know how many labs I've had where people come in saying, we need to make a brochure and we don't know what it's supposed to do? Why do we need a brochure? Well, we need a brochure because we have to sell at this great sales meeting. And why is that with a brochure? Well, everyone has a brochure. Why is that with a brochure? What if the brochure weren't a brochure? What if everybody had a t-shirt that had a question on it and they walked around oh you open their thinking you tap into them in a different way but one of the key parts of this is once they do that then they have to draw a picture and map it and some people are terrible mappers so we say relax you can list it it's okay fill it in but ultimately they draw a little picture and then the real critical part is they have to name it. And when you name something, it gets an identity. It becomes a personality. People will say, how do you take care of your clients? We take care of our clients because our clients are big. They're fortune companies. They have departments and divisions and politics and all this stuff. But underneath it all, if I help by protecting the project or the product, Everybody falls in place because we are the voice of that assignment or product or initiative. And that keeps it neutral. But the idea is that thing, that product, that concept, that whatever needs to be named. And coming up with a name is not only complicated, messy, and sometimes very, very awkward among friends. It's just hard. People are good at naming or they're not. And the challenge comes in, people love to, nah, that's just not it. That's just not it's it. It's very easy just to shut it down. It's, it's very easy. So what happened is we've been working on a particular project here since last March with a client that is very, very innovative. We are a fabulous fit together. And they came up with it. Oh, my bad. They, hang on. That's done now. <laughs> my apologies. Um, they came up with this product they asked us to do it all great but the challenge was they said could you um i said well what's it called oh we don't know we don't know well we don't know we'll come up with a name so it was the no name project for a while and then it came time to put it in packaging and do some covers and do some materials and i said guys we don't what what are we calling this it can't be brand x what what is it we don't we're working on it and so then we said, all right, I'm going to give you a little taste. I'm going to pretend you're in a lab and I'm going to give you six or seven names. You go away and play with them. And they went away and they came, oh, we love this one. Oh, this one's really fun. Wow, you did that so fast. And I said, you know what? This isn't naming. This is giving you an appetizer. If you are really, if you're ready and you want to come in the lab and really name with us, we'll help you get to a name. And that's okay. We can do it. So off they go. And we moved the schedule a month, we moved the schedule a month. And finally, two weeks ago, I said, I just need to put the word stuff on the box because I don't know 
what words to put on here. I, I, you know, the stuff. What, what would you? She said, I know, I know. Well, we've got political things. We've got people high up that really envision something, but they don't know what they envision. So I let them be again. And yesterday, we're on the phone for something else. And I said, so my dear, how's the naming thing coming? And she said, oh, Randy, I am at the point where we should just come into the lab and not leave till we have a name. I said, well, I have been sitting here waiting for you. Are you ready? She said, yes. And she said, I said, but we've got to get the right people at the table. Yeah. We decide. And so I said, remember, I'll meet with you at two o'clock in the morning. Cause this is, these are people who fly all over the place. They do all kinds. I said, any time zone, any place, any hour of the day or night, I'll bring my crayons, my lab coat, my little goggles, I'll come to you and we will not leave that room without a name. And so that's that's what happens is you have to wait till people get ready for a lab because they have to be poised and ready to come into it. I see that being a challenging thing too. You could have a couple people at the table and they bring it back to this big company and someone higher up says, we don't like it. So that's it's why. gotta be very, the choosing of the six people is incredibly, incredibly important because people want, they'll say to me, uh, well, we're a rather large concern, so we would need 28 people at the meeting and use our boardroom. Well, that's really nice, but the rule is six. Six? How, I don't know how to pick six. Oh, we'll help you pick. Part of the reason is what, I, what usually gets them clarity around this is I will say, all right, if you need 28 people, that means 22 or they're going to be watching six of you work. And if you, well, everyone needs to be included. That's okay. We will sandwich that lab. We will prep. We will involve other people. But when that lab door closes and those lab coats go on, six. And it gets people to really focus on, all right, well, who are my real decision makers? And if they come into the lab and they're not in agreement, I don't care because it's where they are and it's authentic. And then you can begin to help them figure out and solve the problem. So yeah, it's tricky, but you have to be open to the fact that you're just showing up with your creative, not just, but you're showing up with your creative arsenal with a process, with a strategy, and they're writing a check. They're writing a big check to come into the lab. Now, not as big as many they'll write and certainly not a big check in comparison to misnaming your product or producing the wrong product. But come, doing creative problem solving is some of the most valuable work that you can bring to a solution. Execution you can get for $17 a, a unit or whatever it is. But concepting that you're doing the right units that's pretty priceless. So that helps them too, the fact that they have to pony up. <laughs> What's been one of the most heated discussions? I'm sure I, this has got to get heated with people. They get. Uh, well, I'll tell you, they do get heated with each other sometimes, and there's a lot of stuff. So sometimes I say, Randy Brill, corporate therapist. Exactly. Sit down, exactly. let's take a breath. We're going to have chocolate. It's like dark, family dark. therapy. Yes, because they, well, businesses are families, and they're just as dysfunctional. But there's a there's a decorum, there's a hierarchy, there's a behavioral model, and there's a hiding. Oh, my hands are tied. Not in this room. They're not. And that it opens a a, a vast amount of discussion. I mean, sometimes. People want to derail. That's actually a bigger risk. It gets heated and then they start talking about things that have absolutely no bearing on it. So you have to kind of parking lot. You have to kind of corral them and say, okay, guys, awesome issue. We're going to take a break. It sounds like that's something that I shouldn't be part of. You guys can break off and do that during, you know, when we stop at 2.30 and bring in ice cream. And people laugh because, of course, I have a lot of food there. But I'm keeping their protein levels up and their caffeine levels up and their candy levels and they're engaged. The key though, is that you have to do two days. And I have learned this, talk about learning the hard way. If I do not have you either physically or in a, a pre-arranged phone connection with the same six people, 24 hours later, we get what I call the overnight sensations. 
And overnight, that people leave a lab so jazzed, so excited, so clear, so energized. But I say to them, you're going to this hotel over here near our office. You're going to eat dinner. You're going to do this. And there's always a basket waiting in their room. And there's always a question or two to hang on the mirror in the hotel. Because what we need them to do is process. If they're going to say, mm, you know, I know that sounded really good over there, but now I'm scared. Now I don't want to do it. It's like remorse. They, type of, like, right. But, so yeah. I call it your overnight sensations. We have to be able to come back together and say, okay, did we go too far? Because sometimes if somebody says, I think we need a brass band suspended from the ceiling, we might be able to do it on iTunes and still accomplish the same thing. I mean, you know, there are sometimes things that can be tethered. But, you know, there's an excitement with it. But the upshot of it all is by the time that second day comes around, we have actionable, clear steps. And invariably, our company then says, okay, they say, you know this, you're clear on this in ways we haven't been able to get clear. Can you build us this prototype? Can you show us what we talked about, what this will look like? So then we are out of the lab and then we do proposals for a fee-based service that basically is not competitive because who's gonna who else are they going to ask to do that sometimes they say i have somebody inside who can do this now we'll take this and run with it great thank you call us the next time you're in this spot we have others who say you know i have people who can execute this but i don't have anybody who can tell this story from a marketing perspective and what team would know it better than yours and and other ones just say okay you know what here go make us we need we need 328,000 of these and I think June and I like that t-shirt thing can you guys do that too do you need t-shirts we got t-shirts you know so we can do all of it and it's it's the front end clarifying process they have to pay for it they get deliverables they get an actionable plan and many of them recognize by that point that there's still more we can do together to help them. Because you can have wonderful ideas. I mean, you know this too. People have great ideas, but it takes a certain amount of tenacity to get traction around a specific idea. Yeah. So. Yeah, even before traction, just executing on it and then getting traction. Yeah. There are a lot of wonderful unfinished symphonies out there. So one of the themes for you is, is people can't tell already is um, go big or go away. That go that big. we talked about, and that kind of comes from you know you building up a 120 person company, the seven story building, and in the past few years you've had some clarity. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about what's become clear. Well, you. I'll tell you exactly what's become clear. I had big in a different way. I had a big building, I had a big mortgage, I had big sales, I had big staff, I had big stress. And I that's how Teacher Peach began in 2012 because I said, you know what, I love my work. I hate my job because I'm fighting for nickels on the dollar. They're not happy, I'm not happy. I've got big businesses trying to commoditize creativity. They want us to do back end, con it just was, it was broken. And something had to give. But I was continually having to take projects that weren't a great fit because I had mouths to feed and mortgages to pay. And we stopped that train. My CFO sold the building. And when that building was sold, it was a little weird to stay in the building after we sold it and suddenly become a tenant in a building you built, which is why you never move in with your realtor, by the way. But I, it was a short term thing. And we went, you know what? I don't need that anymore. What we need is to go small, get smart, get clear and decide what core or core is the core of that company. What are our core offerings? And in the meantime, remember, I've been in a service business for over 30 years. I would exhaust myself selling it, come back to the office, and then the team had to deliver it, and then we had to go sell more work again. So the idea of creating a product-based company, I mean, you talk about stress balls, the fact that, I mean, you talk about tote bags. This tote bag that's in my corner that I schlep back and forth all the time, this tote bag is one of the first products I built, and I built that 
maybe in 2013. I haven't built it again since. We just keep manufacturing it. So from a creative perspective, the fact that I could build a thing and sell it many times was delightfully attractive to a service-based creative person. Yeah. So that helped us gain perspective. In 2015, you know, for 13 and 14, I was trying, I was doing both and I was like not doing you know, we're going to do creative only. And that was the inception of the creativity lab and confirming people would write a check, confirming that it is an industry agnostic service that professional services firms can use, that, you know, doctors and lawyers can use, that training groups can use, that restaurants can use, anybody who has a challenge. So it's industry agnostic as opposed to what we had been, which was in the education arena. What I've since learned is that you're educating people in every arena. So it's very universal, that learning and training and creativity too. But that aside, in 13 and 14, I did both. In 15, I did both. And I would take these projects on it. We're gonna take a break, but you wanna know something? They would call with something delicious and we would do the project. And then they would call with this, it was delicious. So finally, 2016, my partner, Bob and I said, okay, we gotta get serious. If this teacher peach, B to C thing is going to work. We need to batten down the hatches and really put our heart and soul. This you can't do this from two to five in the morning, Randy. You need to show up, or you're going to just you're not going to know if this was ever going to fly. So we took 2016. I was the stress ball queen, and I have been told I have stress balls many different times in my life. But that aside, the point being. We focused on it. We created a lot of new product. We tested new things. We marketed in new ways. And we got, we ran a parallel universe between our own e-commerce site and Amazon. And by the end of 2016, got clear on two things. Number one, if Teacher Peach, which is gift products, motivational products, and inspirational products for teachers, kids, and anyone who helps anybody learn and grow, if that was going to fly, I needed to make a decision, and the decision was either our shops, our, our own e-commerce site, or Amazon, and we ran the comparison for a year, and Amazon outpaced it so much, it made no sense for the percentage of our business that was happening here. So we have a website that communicates our philosophies and our beliefs and our strategies, and you want to buy stress balls or tote bags or greeting cards or positive postcards, you click and you go right to the Amazon page and you can check out. Teachers are on a budget. They like Amazon Prime. We wanted them to be able to have that. So we are a great fulfilled by Amazon merchant. We, we love Amazon and it works for us. That business has more than doubled between 2016 and 2017 so far. We have surpassed all of last year already and that was before back to school and before holiday our two biggest times of year so that was over there but in the meantime i had to get clear on this creative side and as always your clients will help you get clear by the work they bring to you and frankly the checks they write to you people tell you if what you give them has value they really do so that's been the balancing act and so we were small and we were kind of testing both but they both have to get big not 180 big not eight stories not physically but big you think big i mean when i say to you something you know you're going to do something and you want something that's i don't know has 32 parts to it and i say to you what if you had 320 parts? How would you scale it? How would you think about it differently? What what would you do to prepare? And that's what go big or go away means. I'm really clear now, now that I'm much older than I've ever been. I'm clear. I mean, I started running a business at 25 years of age. I didn't know what would work or what wouldn't. I always say it was like crisscross spaghetti sauce. I threw everything around until I figured out the few things. Now I'm clear. I know the few things I'm supposed to do. Hmm. But just hmm. because I am the entrepreneur in residence doesn't imply or mean or should be construed for any entrepreneur that you should be good at everything. You know, I mean, if I needed a new roof, 
I can't be the one who climbs up on that roof and inspects the roofer's work. First of all, that's not the kind of ladder I climb. Second of all, I would probably end up in the emergency room. And third of all, I wouldn't know what it was. Yeah, it looks like a roof. There we go. Here's your check. What would I do? So you have to be able to trust and rely on others, which means to go big or go away. The go away part is don't distract me. Don't distract me from the things that I should be doing But I need to be a magnet as an entrepreneur to say, oh, you there with your marketing savvy over here. You who promotes a book, go. I'm not the book promoter, but I will show up at 430 wherever you tell me to go. But you have to drive that. And so you are able and open to surround yourself with the best talented experts so that that's how you go big. Hmm. But if you're going to do that, then frankly, go away. What's so thanks, Randy? What what's the most popular product for teacher patients? For teachers, yeah, uh, they're tote bags. Teachers love. Teachers have stuff. They have stuff. And one of the things that was a, a foundation of this business is the fact that if you looked at the products that the world was offering to teachers, they were offering things like, "I'm a teacher. My favorite times of the year are Thanksgiving, winter break, and summer." No, oh, they're not. These are dedicated, passionate people who work so hard. They have one of the toughest jobs in the world. We trust them with our kids. We say, you're going to spend more time with my child than I'm going to spend during the 180-day school year. You're with my kid eight hours a day. If you're happy, if you're motivated, if you're inspired, I reach 25 to 45 children who have a better day. I don't do content for those classrooms. There are amazing educational publishers and suppliers that we design for. I had to not compete with those. So I don't mm. do content. I had to find a place where that didn't work. We do the stuff under. We want motivated and inspired teachers. We want motivated and inspired kids. We want kids with confidence. If you're a confident kid, that's why positive postcards matter. Because if you get a postcard from your teacher that says you made a wise choice today and I noticed it's an amazing story uh, you know there's well, there's the one I tell is uh, one of the first products I did was a card that said I believe in you and I gave them out to teachers while we were promoting them and I gave it to a teacher and then the following year I was back in Peoria and this teacher said you you're the lady with the purple card I said Yeah, she said, you gave me a purple card last year that said, I believe in you. And I gave it to a little boy. I saved it and I I wrote him a note and I said, I believed in him. And it turned out the kid was living in a shelter and then he had to move out of town and go live with his aunt. And he left my school. And six months later, he came to me and he said, Mrs. Johnson, I still have the purple card in my shoebox. Because what he had for all his precious things was a shoebox. And she said, I didn't even remember the card. And I realized... Mm -hmm. It changed, it changed his level of confidence. And he said, I think I'm okay to go now. And, you know, when you work on that stuff at 3 o'clock in the morning, you think, is this really going to matter to somebody? It does. It, I can tell you based on the teachers who buy them and the sales that we make on Amazon that positive postcards and greeting cards. We send notes home to families. Do you know we never use the word parent? You look at any teacher peach card, you will never see the word parent because a lot of families don't have them. There are many ways to make a family. There are many ways to make that connection. So we talk about partnership. We talk about knowing your child. So you don't know what goes on behind the scenes. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud as punch of that business. I know what my job is with that business. My job is not to be on those Amazon phone calls. They love me dearly, but they don't like when I come. And you want to know something? They're doubling revenue every time I turn around. It's going really well without me being over there. When they need a new concept for a bag or a design or a strategy, that's where I show up with my crayons. So tote bags are really powerful because our messages are really powerful. You know, we have a message that says, I teach, therefore I change lives every single day. I teach, therefore I explore, I empower, and I do all of these things before 9 o'clock in the morning. That's what teachers do, and that's why they buy the product. So there, it, it's. I'm very excited about holiday for 2017. We've got great new stuff coming out. Very cool. Yeah. People should check it out. Teacher Peach. It's a good name, also. Teacher Peach. Good Peach. Because mm. an app 
for the teacher just isn't enough anymore. Why grapple with an apple when you can reach for the peach? You knew that was coming. I, I didn't. <laughs> reach for the peach. You can just, you know, just search us on Amazon and all the products will come up and there's a product page so they can poke around. So, Randy, a question. I have one last question. Sure. And but before I ask it, and the last question is I need, before I ask it or have you do it, show me, is you have some really cool stuff in your office. Like when I look over your shoulder, I'm seeing crayons, I'm seeing these pictures. So in a second, I want you to point out the reason for okay. for those okay. things. But okay. first, I want to just find out, you know, um, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask what's been the lowest moment business-wise and what's been the proudest moment business-wise? The lowest moment was, and I, I can see it very, very clearly, I had initially, I had to learn to trust the hard way because I was so trusting. I had a, I had a partner at one point, didn't go well, and I should have said, this isn't working long before I did. And it became one of the most painful and challenging exits for each of us. And this was a, an incredible partnership during the years that it was. And it was a great loss to me personally. And I had to figure out two things. Number one, that I had to learn to trust people differently. And I had to learn to verify differently without thinking I had to climb on the ladder to look on the roof. And I had to trust myself. Mm, because your when intuition. You're creative, well, when you're the creative entrepreneur and you're the rainmaker, there are a lot of people that surround you that are going to manage you. You know, Frank Sinatra, they used to say to me, Frank never booked his own stage bookings. Well, very good. But somebody told Frank where to go and Frank said yes or no and he had to do the singing. Now, of course, if I told that today, I'd have to use somebody like Lady Gaga for anyone to know what he's talking about. But the key is you each have different roles. But when you're surrounded by people who sometimes used to tell me how much I needed them and couldn't do without them, and I was young, I was really young, and there weren't a lot of 25-year-old entrepreneurs when I was a girl. I mean, today, if you're 20, you're old. But then that was really gutsy. I had no money. I had no anything. And I had a typewriter that didn't typos. And it was really a typewriter. So I'm dating myself here. But, but the point is you look at that situation and you begin to doubt. Oh, my gosh. I really do need somebody else. I really do. Mm. Want to do something. There's a balance. Because that was the pivot. I went from depending so greatly, getting so deeply burned, trusting no one. And now I feel like I got it. Go big or go away is about bringing other confident, trusted experts and getting out of their way. Doing my thing, them doing theirs, and empowering with resources, energy, creativity, money. You know, I'm very happy to be my chief VC. I, you know, I like the ability to say, you know what? It may not make sense today, but we're growing our way into a new challenge. I'm writing this check. I will write a check to invest in any aspect of this. I don't waste money, though. But the key for me was that was the lowest low, but it's turned out to guide me to the highest high. I'm doing better work today. I am doing more creative work today, and I'm working with incredibly motivated and inspired people both inside and outside of the organization or our client list. The people want to come and color with us. That's fun and exciting. I see a teacher in the airport going into the ladies room with one of my tote bags slinging over her shoulder dragging two kids and that's kind of like uh, I made that tote bag. That's my tote bag. Look up there. Look. And you grab your daughter's attention. There. Look. Look. It's cool. It, you know your stuff is out in the world. So the lowest was learning some lessons. I never learned to learn lessons the easy way. That just didn't work. Any more than doing it small worked. So you make big mistakes with confidence that you can fix them. So that's really, that's the powerful high. And knowing that you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. So there you have it. So you want to see my toys? You want yes. to see what's around me? This is my 
little studio. This is like my little hub. Yeah, so describe it because, you know, people may be listening to the audio uh, if they're not watching the video. So okay. what, uh, what do you have behind you? Um, what do I have behind? Well, mm -hmm. this is my prized possession of all, which are my ruby slippers. Now, everybody, you have to be willing to put on your client's shoes. If I can't walk in your shoes as my client, I'm not going to be able to help you. Nobody's going to get anywhere. That's actually one of the wows. So I always, now granted these are lovely platforms. They are my size. I don't wear them often, but sometimes for effect. You have to be willing to put on the shoes. I need, I'm a visual person. I need the reminders. People like to say, what is all this stuff in your space? Because as a creative, you you get inspired by my other shoes, which are equally important, and these are not my size. They're my clown shoes. You have to be able to clown and entertain. So I always keep these here. Usually they have M and M's in them, and they have uh, bullseye candy in them. But today they're somebody's been in here. But anyway, um, the crayons. These crayons are actual real crayons. Mm -hmm. I found again. I don't do small, so there are my crayons. I have supplies, these ladies behind me, very strong, iconic women who all did it their own way. And I found these at a Brandeis book sale on clearance in a bin. And I saved them for a long time and discovered them when I sold the building. And I went, oh, my old life magazines that I bought for a nickel. And I, put, I decided between Sophia Lauren, Grace Kelly, Julie Andrews, and then another Sophia Loren, because you can't have too many. Um, it was powerful. On the other side, you can't see, but Barbara Streisand is over there. Um, NCIS, one of my favorite shows. There's a big, giant cutout. Do you want to see him? Big, giant cutout of Leroy Jethro Gibbs. Here, sit down, Jethro. He's in my office. If I am away, NCIS is in charge. And what I love about this is... In 42 minutes, they solve a problem, no commercials, and I am confident. He's on in the middle of the night with me. So the entire NCIS team is, is here. And when I go away, Jethro stands at the desk, and everybody knows somebody's watching. So it's, it's a silly, busy little place. This is the three-year-old who wrote her first order. Mm. So I don't think it's sepia because it's just... It was toned that way. So this is my playpen. So I hope this was interesting to you and to your listeners. Um, creativity is everywhere. And you, you, if you, it's inside everybody. Sometimes they just need somebody to coax it out. So Randy, I want to be the first one to thank you. Where you, should we point people towards? Um, you can go to coracore.com, which is absolutely. Q U A R A c-o-r-e dot com you can go That's to right. teacherpeach.com and you can check out 99 creative wows on amazon you can get a kindle and, and go to 99 creative wows dot com for blogs etc okay there. awesome anywhere else we should point people towards or is you that know, the one thing i will say is if you go to coracore.com and this is kind of for people like you and me who do worry in the middle of the night about oh i've got to solve this you can click on any screen and it'll take you to a box that you can get to me with a message about whatever your challenge is for the lab hmm. any time of the day or night. So you don't have to say, oh, that was interesting. I'll send an email and wonder if anyone will get back to me. Trust me. We'll respond. All right. Okay. Check out CoraCore.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randy. Take care. Bye-bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand.